Um, I know it's a beautiful day outside, so thank you for taking the time to learn about wetlands on Zoom. Um, certainly, I think that wetlands are in a lot of people's mind, at least mine, during this time in August when we have had pretty dry weather and our rivers are looking pretty low. And just thinking about where all that water is, how to support those rivers and the importance of wetlands in that process. Um, I know in some areas of Vermont, we had some pretty big storms um, also on Tuesday. So, so keep that in mind. Um, so my name is Karina Daly. I'm the Ecological Restoration Coordinator with VNRC and um, John Groveman from VNRC is also joining me today. And I'm gonna start this presentation by just talking a little bit about wetlands, what they are. John, if you wanna switch slides, that would be great. So these are the topics we'll cover. Wetlands, what they are and how they're important. And then John's gonna talk about jurisdiction in Vermont, um, both the federal jurisdiction and state jurisdiction. And then I'm gonna jump back into wetland functions and values in Vermont. And then we're gonna um, talk a little bit about the potential changes to the wetland rules in Vermont. So John, if you could switch to the next slide. All right, so this is when I like to ask everyone what they think a wetland is. Um, and you're welcome to add it into the chat if you'd like. But I think that a lot of people think of wetlands as your iconic cattail swamp. And there are in Vermont so many wetlands that are much more than that. And it's truly those wetlands that have been in production or farmed for a long time that become the cattail swamp. But it's the forested wetlands, the floodplain wetlands, the hardwood swamps, the alder swamps that really define Vermont's wetlands. So um, much less so the cattail swamp. And wetlands aren't necessarily wet for that long in the growing season. Um, they only need to, um, to define a wetland, they only need to support wetland vegetation for about two weeks of the growing season. So, um, it can be just, you know, a tractor rut that holds water for a certain period of time. And um, if it's holding water for two weeks, then that's long enough to change the soil type underneath and the vegetation on top and create what's called a definitional wetland. Um, so wetlands are defined um, by the Army Corps of Engineers. And there are three parameters that define what is a wetland, the hydrology, the soils, and the vegetation. And there are indicators for each three of those parameters, and you have to have all three parameters to have a wetland. So if it doesn't have, and this is from a jurisdictional level, um, and definitional according to the Army Corps of Engineers. But if you don't have hydrology, then you don't have a wetland. So you could have the vegetation in the soils, but you don't have the hydrology. And I'm gonna get into more details on that as we go. Wetlands are important because they are that unique area where land and water intersect. Um, I had a high school science teacher and I'm sure many of you did, who, or you've heard the term wetlands are the kidneys of the earth. And that is truly what they are. They are filtering um, nutrients and sediments and removing them. And the water that flows in is dirtier than the water that flows out. <clears throat> Wetlands um, mitigate flooding by slowing and storing water. They create flood attenuation. They create that physical space to slow water down. They also provide wildlife habitat and are great areas for recreation and wetlands are protected um, under the Clean Water Act, um, in, which was enacted in 1972 to protect and preserve those functions um, that wetlands support. And they are protected against discharge and dredge of fill material in a wetland. So you can't put your excavator in a wetland and rip it up and dredge that wetland nor can you dump a load of gravel in a wetland. So that's protecting those functions that are that those kidneys of the earth, um, so those functions that are a wetland. The U.S. Army Corps regulates wetlands 
um, because they are tied to navigable waters. So they define wetlands as those wetlands that are connected or somehow contiguous within a distance to um, tributaries that drain into navigable waters. Next slide, John. There are, I, I spoke briefly earlier about the examples, the many different wetlands in Vermont, but um, I think it's important to recognize wetland fringes around streams. So those riparian wetlands, um, those riparian wetlands can be forested, they can be shrub wetlands, they can be big, big floodplain forests, silver maple, ostrich fern, swamps, so you've probably um, maybe picked fiddleheads in. They can be shoreline wetlands along lakes. Um, they can be um, alder swamps. They can be willow, large willow stands. Um, they can be softwood swamps. We have black spruce wetlands, tamarack wetlands. Um, uh, there are high headwater seeps, um, often comprised of jewel weed and, and different variety of sedges and rushes. And those seeps um, usually are groundwater fed and support drainages that flow downstream and support our bigger rivers. There are also vernal pools, which are ephemeral wetlands, which only hold water for um, a very short por portion of the growing season and often aren't even vegetated or have very little vegetation in them. And those can be very large, you know, up to an acre, or they can be very small, you know, only 10 square feet or so. So those vernal pools support an abundance of um, amphibian species that are adapted to that ephemeral um, pool life and are unique um, in that respect as well. And then there are the fens and bogs that accumulate peat and those wetlands are unique for, for that characteristic. Next slide, John. So wetland indicators, um, they're basically the biggest indicator is squishy ground <laughs> or a very easy indicator for someone who is unfamiliar with wetlands. But if you, if you are walking and you feel squishy ground, you're, you're likely in a wetland. Um, saturation at the surface in, and uneven hummocks. So, you know, you can have that micro topography that shows sort of pits and mounds and that's where the root system of vegetation is weak because you're in a wetland and trees have fallen down over time and it's created these hummocks and these and these low areas so the that pit and mound topography is unique to you know forests where there's storm events but also to wetlands where the soil is shallow and um, the roots aren't that established um, so areas you wouldn't want to drive your car obviously could be a wetland as well wetlands are dominated by hydrophytic plants um, and there's you know, a whole list of hydrophytic plants, but cattails, reed canary grass, bulrush, willows, dogwood, speckled alder, green ash, red maple, American elm, um, silver maple, cedar. There's, you know, a long list, but those are some of the common ones that you guys might know. And also looking at aerial imagery before you you know, go out to a site or if you're curious if you have seen a wetland can be a really good tool. Um, the ANR Natural Resource Atlas, Google Earth Timeline, looking at photos of a site over time, you can sometimes see the inundation in the photo, um, see the standing water. USGS Soil Survey has the mapped hydric soils on a site. So hydric soils are often a really good indicator of wetlands. Um, but certainly not every hydric soil is a wetland, but often if you see hydric soils on a map and you go to those sites, you, you are likely to find wetlands in the area, so it can be a good indicator. And um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has national wetlands inventory mapping, which um, the state of Vermont has, in addition to that, they have the Vermont significant wetlands mapping 
which is available on that ANR Natural Resource Atlas. But that national, it's often nice to turn on both the national wetlands layer and the state layer to see um, how those two mapping boundaries intersect and overlap and are often tied together. Go ahead, John, next slide. Um, so wetland delineations are what defines the boundaries of a wetland. Um, and wetland delineations are necessary for when a property is being, um, is changing hands and development is proposed or conservation is proposed. So it's in um, defining those wetland boundaries, we have a sense of the extent of wetlands on a, on a site and within the whole state. Delineations are good for five years, and they're only good for five years because of the dynamic nature of wetlands. They change over time, and obviously, um, because hydro hydrologic regimes change over time, areas dry up, areas may get wetter, vegetation changes with climate change, so that's why they're, they're only good for five years, and they need to be updated every five years. And they're based on, um, something way back in 1987, the Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual, and that manual defines the wetlands. Um, and then in addition to that manual, and I think it was like 2016, they updated it with regional supplements for each region. So there's the delineation manual, and then there's this regional supplement. Um, and the Northeast Regional Supplement has additional criteria that are specific to this area as it relates to Vegetative, vegetation indicators, hydrology indicators, and soil indicators. So um, it's important to use both tools when you're delineating a wetland. Um, wetland delineators are, are folks that are qualified to do that. So not anyone can just come in. You can try to come in and try to delineate a wetland. But in the state of Vermont, you have to be on the list of qualified wetland consultants and have had experience in documentation delineating wetlands in the past to define a wetland area. And again, like I said, there's those three parameters, hydrology, wetlands, and soil that, that define a wetland and then shape the delineation of that boundary. But, um, but that boundary, isn't easy and I'll get into details as we go. John, next slide, please. So here, I think this is a good diagram just showing, um, this is the Army Corps jurisdiction of wetlands and waters. And you can see, the, you know, the section 10 water, rivers, streams, and lakes jurisdiction. And then beyond that is an, just an example of of the wetlands area, those freshwater wetlands that are connected to rivers and streams. And it's not always this straightforward at all, but it's just a, it's just a good visual to understand the section 404 discharge of dredge material um, jurisdiction and then the section 10 ordinary high water jurisdiction. Um, next slide, John. So those three parameters, wetland hydrology, vegetation, and soil. Hydrology obviously is the driving force behind the development and maintenance of all wetlands. And when you are delineating a wetland or defining a wetland, you're only looking at the top 12 to 18 inches of the soil surface. So you're not looking that deep. That's why like using an auger or shovel is all you need to use. And you're looking at the presence of water in that soil profile. Um, and again, like I said, you only need water in that profile for 5% of the growing season to define a wetland. Um, and the hydro hydrologic regimes um, can vary definitely between the wetland type and the site conditions. So there are those running water wetlands that um, those lodic wetlands. So creeks, rivers, streams, um, groundwater, there's surface water, there's intermittent water, all of those can support wetlands. And then there's primary, primary indicators for wetland hydrology, which is high water table, saturation at the surface, 
um, evidence of watermarks on the trees or sediment deposits. So, you know, you can have your floodplain wetland with some drift deposits and sediment on the side and that that in itself is an indicator. You might not have saturation at the time of the delineation, but you have those other indicators. Um, using aerial photography and looking at vegetation or inundation is another indicator. Water stained leaves, marl deposits, oxidized roots, um, a sulfitic odor, so that, that rotten egg smell. All of those are examples of primary indicators. And there's um, this image on the right shows a wetland delineation data form and the indicators under hydrology. I know it's probably too hard for you guys to see up close, but there is a, a, a long list of them and criteria for each. And that Northeast Regional Supplement that I explained earlier provides detail on that. Next slide. And if there's questions as I'm going through this, feel free to ask questions. Um, wetland vegetation. So vegetation has to be hydrophytic. It's plants that are adapted to surviving in saturated soils. So, and greater than 50% of the vegetation on a site that you're defining as a wetland has to show signs of hydrophytic vegetation. So there is this whole wetland indicator status and wetland plant list, which reflects the frequency a species occurs in a wetland. And there's different scales of how wet that plant likes their roots. So an obligate plant are those plants that occur 99 to 100% of the time in a wetland, while a facultative wet plant occurs 67 to 99% in wetlands. So it's just how much those plants like to get wet. Facultative plants occur 33 to 67% in wetlands, and they can occur in upland areas as well. So you, you often see those plants in both wetland settings and upland settings. Good examples of facultative, facultative plants are hawthorn, apple trees, um, Carpus carolinium, musclewood, you often see those plants on the edge of wetlands because they're defining that they're sort of like to have their feet wet or they're okay having it dry. Um, white pine is another one where you can often see it in wetlands or uplands. It's not facultative, it's facultative up, but it's sort of a, a problem species where it, where it can't decide where to grow all the time or it likes to adapt to either climate. And then there are those facultative upland plants, which really you, you wouldn't see them in a wetland. That doesn't mean they're not going to be in a wetland um, 1 to 33% of the time, but it's more unusual. And then there's obviously the remaining plants are those upland plants or non-indicator plants that are excluded that you, you still might see them in a wetland, but they're just not linked to wetland vegetation. So they aren't true hydrophytic plants. Next slide. Oh, and I, the, the photo on the last slide of the Eupatorium um, Joe pie weed is something that I just wanted to, right now you can often, Eupatorium is a good example of defining wetlands in this season. So you can look through fields and just see that purple Eupatorium and know that you're in a wetland most likely. Um, wetland soils. Wetland soils are saturated and inundated for much or all of the growing season. And they, so again, you may not see saturation, but you see evidence of the soil chain, of the soil having been wet for long enough in that growing season to create a hydric soil. So the characteristics of a hydric soil um, often show a blue or gray glade color. Um, and that's just the stripping of the iron out of the soil. So as water is moving up and down in the soil column, it's moving the minerals around and the iron is reacting and creating these little reddish brown models or speckles nodules in the soil. So you often see that and you often, often see the stripping of color or that glade color. Um, in a wetland soil. And those are mineral-based soils. There's also the peat, the organic soils, where you would see just a really dark organic soil. And those soils are often tied to that 
sulfitic odor, that smell. And again, you're only looking within the upper 16 inches of the soil surface, so you're not digging deep um, to see these indicators. But the soil, even if you didn't have the hydrology, um, but you had the vegetation, you didn't have the hydrology in that it wasn't saturated at the, at the time. So you didn't have the squishy feet test, you didn't have standing water, but you do have you know, a concave area with wetland vegetation and you dig into the soil and you see that glade matrix and those models, then you know you're in a wetland. And I guarantee that there's some hydrology indicator in that space, even in August when it's nice and dry. Next slide. Oh, John, I'm gonna pass it over to you. <laughs> really enjoying all the science. <laughs> so Karina is uh, uh, clearly a, a, an expert in the science of wetlands. I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm just going to go through some of the legal framework of wetland protection in Vermont. Um, so, so basically, which wetlands are protected in Vermont? It, it really is a, it's a synonym for whether or not you need a permit to work within a wetland. And as Karina mentioned earlier, there's federal and state protections. So the Army Corps of Engineers is a federal agency that regulates wetlands. Karina alluded to this. And an individual permit is required from the Army Corps of Engineers if you have quote unquote significant impacts on wetlands. And this is all from section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And, that, and that's basically significant. It has been, uh, it, it means you have more than one acre of impact. Um, if you're gonna have that much impact, you need um, the, the, any state has the right to issue what they call a water quality certificate. Um, so if you need that Army Corps individual permit, you may have to get uh, a water quality certificate from the state. Um, these are really for really big projects, often with energy projects, energy pipeline projects, large ski area projects involving snowmaking, highway projects. You know, these are not like the run of the mill a sort of development project in Vermont. Um, but when you do have a project like that, I just described, um, the Army Corps permit and the water quality certificate is a really important regulatory tool. Um, if you have between a half acre and an acre of impact, you, you need to seek coverage under a general permit from the Army Corps. That just means that there, you don't have to go through an individual permit review, but there's a general permit that sets out practices and conditions you need to follow and you need to just get say you want to be covered by the permit um, one of the challenges with the army corps is that they only have two staff people in vermont so if you need coverage under that general permit you know, they don't really have a lot of staff for enforcement or uh, inspection um, but those two staff people do the work on the individual permits that i just mentioned um, the state of Vermont has its own wetland program, separate and apart from the federal program. And the Vermont program is governed by the Vermont wetland rules. You can go on the Agency of Natural Resources website and click and find the most recent version of the wetland rules. Um, so under the wetland rules, any wetland on official maps, and these are the maps that Karina referenced, the National Wetland Inventory Maps, is automatically regulated by the state. So if you're gonna do any activity within one of these uh, wetlands that are on these official maps. If you're in that wetland or a 50 foot buffer around the wetland, and that's important because the Army Corps of Engineers does not address buffers around wetlands um, or maps for that matter. Um, but if you're on the map in Vermont, work in that wetland or the 50 foot buffer, you have to get a permit from the Agency of Natural Resources. So, but even if you're not on a map, the Agency of Natural Resources can find that the wetland on your property or an A property is significant for one of the functions and values. We're gonna talk about functions and values a little later. They're listed in the wetland rules. Uh, they're all the different values of the wetlands that Karina just went over. Um, and if it's significant for even one, the ANR can designate the wetland as needing a permit um, for work in the wetland and that 50 foot buffer. Um, the wetland rules have a list of what they call allowed uses. So there's a long list of things that you can do in a wetland or buffer that you don't need a permit for. 
and I've listed some of them here. Uh, I'm not going to read them. You can read them on the slide and people who look at this later can read them, but you should know they exist. Um, you know, things like, you know, mowing lawns and activities that are, if the lawn had already existed and if a residential property existed and there's activity that's incidental to that use, there is utility activities and, but anyway, it's important to know if you're gonna, if you wanna understand whether you need a permit or not, you need to go to that list of allowed uses. In addition to the allowed uses, there is an exemption for farming activities on land that has been used to grow food or crops since 1990. 1990 is the year that the wetland rules went into effect. So this provision has been controversial in the last couple of years, and I'll talk about it when I talk about potential changes to the wetland rules but that is an exemption from the wetland rules. So if a wetland permit is required, the standard is pretty simple. You have to avoid, minimize, and if you minimize to the point that you still have an impact, you have to mitigate impacts on wetland functions and values. If impacts can't be mitigated, there's a compensation section of the wetland rules. So mitigation, you know, basically, is meaning that you are, if you have uh, some impact, you're taking steps to, to avoid it or um, address the, the functional, the, the impact of the function and values. Compensation is basically having to, you having so much of an impact that you actually have to create wetland um, or restore wetland in an area to make up for the loss of functions and values. We don't use the compensation section very much in Vermont. And I'll talk about that also when I talk about potential changes to the rules. So here are the uh, functions and values. I don't know, Karina, do you want to go through these? Yeah. Um, so, so I alluded to this earlier that not all wetlands are created equal. And I say that only because I think it is important to understand that there are wetlands that are definitional, definitional, they meet the hydro, the three parameters, the hydrology, the soil, the vegetation, but they may not be jurisdictional. So like John spoke to about the different class classifications in Vermont of wetlands, um, in this state, not all wetlands are created equal. There are class one, class two, and class three wetlands. So a wetland that meets the criteria um, maybe, you know, of definitional wetlands could be class three. And at the state level, that means it's not jurisdiction under their jurisdiction. It still has federal jurisdiction, but it's considered isolated and, you know, of a small size and not having these functions. So these are the functions in Vermont that, um, that basically for a wetland to be significant and jurisdictional, it has to um, serve one or more of these 10 functions. And those functions are water storage for flood water and storm runoff. So again, that physical space to attenuate and mitigate flooding. Um, surface and groundwater protection. So that's that water purification, water quality function of a wetland. Is it serving that purpose? Fish habitat. Um, and it doesn't need to, the wetland itself doesn't need to provide fish habitat, but it may provide the food sources for fish habitat downstream. Um, wildlife habitat. So does the wetland provide wildlife habitat? And under each of these um, functions, there's a list of, and you can find this on the state wetlands website, but there's sort of a wetland functional assessment form with boxes of different criteria you know, within each of these functions. Does it have, you know, a constricted inlet and outlet? And what does the upstream development look like? And what is the, what is the habitat around it? What wildlife does it support? So it's not just that, yes, obviously all wetlands are going to have some form of wildlife, but there are specific criteria that supports, you know, is it a forested wetland or is it an emergent wetland? and the wildlife habitat associated with a more biodiverse wetland obviously is, is gonna be greater. Um, so so um, five, the 
function five is exemplary wetland natural community. So is it, is it one of those natural communities, um, the woodland, wetlands, woodlands, wet, wetlands, woodlands, and wildland book, about half of this book is all the different wetlands in Vermont. Um, and there are literally, you know, are many, many different types of wetlands. So, but some of those wetlands are exemplary and rare. And if it is one of those, then it would fall under that natural community. Um, if the wetland contains a rare, threatened, or endangered species, then that can bump it into that um, class two jurisdictional status. So it may be a very small farm field wetland um, that has a rare rush and therefore becomes a class two wetland. So that, that in itself is enough to bump it into jurisdictional status. If the wetland provides a unique opportunity for education and research, um, that can make it significant. Uh, the recreational value and economic benefit of the wetland. And then the, um, the wetlands open space and aesthetic quality, as well as erosion control. So does that wetland provide, um, what is the sinuosity of the wetland? What is um, its capacity to trap sediment and slow water down and filtrate? Um, so erosion control is also a very important one. And, and Next slide, John. <laughs> All right, back to me. So Karina, as Karina said, uh, I'll just kind of, uh, you know, kind of emphasize some of these class one, two, three wetland. So that's how we classify wetlands in Vermont. I think we're the only state that actually uses this sort of classification system. Class two just means you need a permit. You're either on the map or you're significant for one of the functions that Karina just uh, went over and you're found to be significant for one of those functions by the Agency of Natural Resources. Class three wetlands are wetlands that meet the scientific definition of a wetland, what Karina went over in terms of hydrology, vegetation, and soils, but you're not on the map, you're not found to be significant for one of those functions. Those class three wetlands, as Karina indicated, the Army Corps does not care. They don't look at the functions and values and significance, and they don't look at maps. They just look at hydrology, vegetation, and soils, and they look at how many acres of wetland are being disturbed. So even if you're not, uh, you know, jurisdictional class two wetland in Vermont, the Army Corps doesn't care. Class one are Vermont's most ecologically significant wetlands, and they're defined in the wetland rules as exceptional and irreplaceable in its contribution to Vermont's natural heritage. That's a direct quote. Um, I just think that's such a funny way to always describe it. I always get a kick out of that. But that's the definition. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know it when you see it, these really usually, there's something really special about them, either in terms of the size of the wetland or the vegetation or the habitat they provide. Um, there, I always forget how many there are. We didn't have very many until the last couple of years, the Agency of Natural Resources for the first time or the last five years started to designate class ones on their own. I think we're up to like seven or eight now. Karina, I don't know if you know. Oh, that's close. I think, yeah. yeah, I thought we were leaning close to 10. So I yeah, think we're probably getting close to 10. And we, we were hanging in like the three range for a long, a long time. VNRC has actually been involved with at least three petitions to designate class one wetlands. And so this could either be done by the Agency of Natural Resources or um, anybody could petition. And we recently petitioned to have the La Platte River wetland in Shelburne designated as class one. And that's a good example of a wetland that's just, it's, it's just this really special area where there's really unique vegetation there, um, a riverine wetland in an area where the river is going into the lake. There's just a lot of ecological factors that make it unique. Um, and the agency granted our petition. Uh, we were involved with designating the North Shore wetland in Burlington as class one, which is interesting because it's, you know, it's in Burlington. It's in our most uh, urban uh, part of the state, but it's also an area where, um, where the Winooski meets Lake, lake Champlain. It creates some really interesting ecological condi conditions and some rare uh, soils and vegetation there. Um, you know, there are areas like 
Uh, the Peach and Bog was just designated as a gigantic, beautiful bog and fen, that, as Karina talked about. But anyway, it's really, it's a very good part of the program to be able to designate these areas. And I think Karina and I hope to do some work to designate some more going into the future. Class one wetlands are, they're treated differently from a regulatory sense. You can get a permit to do work in a class two wetland. You cannot do any work in a class one wetland. You just can't, you just, it's prohibited. So you're not, you gotta stay out of the wetland itself. Um, and there's a default 100 foot buffer around these class one wetlands. And you could get a permit to do work within the buffer. Um, but often the buffer is, is, is much larger than 100 feet because it's really what's necessary to protect the functions and values. So, it really, you know, all, all the class ones have variable buffers. It's much more complex than just, you know, 50 foot buffer around a class two wetland. Um, it's always good to note that Act 250 and the Public Utilities Commission through what's known as Section 248, which is basically their uh, criteria and process for reviewing energy projects that get built. They don't go through Act 250, those projects, they go through the, the Public Utility Commission. You could have a class three wetland not regulated by the state, but uh, it, would be, it could be regulated under Act 250 of the Public Utility Commission. And as I said, the Army Corps does not use the classification system. So that, that kind of takes us to the end and potential changes to the wetland rules and wetland regulation in Vermont that we want people to be aware of. And at some point we're gonna really need the support of people to help us argue for positive changes to the uh, wetland protection in Vermont, make sure we don't weaken the rules. So the first thing I would note is that it's been you know, a bad four years for uh, federal environmental protection. Generally, the Trump administration, if you follow the news, has weakened many regulations and uh, uh, the federal laws for a variety of environmental programs that have been in place for decades. And the wetlands is, is, is not immune to this. Um, there's been a big debate. Karina noted that the Army Corps' uh, regulatory program is really tied to the wetlands connection to navigable waters. So the Trump administration repealed an Obama era rule that had a pretty broad definition of navigable waters. And the, the Trump administration has now put forward, I believe the rule has been ado adopted, a really narrow definition of what is a navigable water, which will limit the wetlands that the Army Corps will protect and can protect. That rule is in litigation. And, you know, interestingly enough, I think that there are different regions of the Army Corps. I think the different regions are uh, approaching the interpretation of navigable waters differently. I think our region has still been holding, like, they haven't changed very much. I don't know, Karina, if you've had experience with them. That's what I've heard, at least, you know. But yeah. very tenuous, it seems to me, because other regions are, have really narrowed their the, you know, the wetlands are protecting ba based on that definition of what's a navigable water. Yeah, I think you're right, John. Um, there hasn't been a lot of change from the New England district and the Vermont office in particular that I've seen. Yeah. But Something that we have our eye on and it, you know, it's, it's, we really need a good rule in place. So aside from the federal government, the state is actually for four years um, and I know that's an incredible to say, but it's really been going on for four years, um, looking at changing the wetland rules and statutes. They've proposed changes in the jurisdictional approach, trying to get away from the maps. They've proposed to say a wetland has to be a certain size to, to you know, trigger jurisdiction and needing a permit. VNRC and many of our partners, we've opposed those efforts um, because we think it would really uh, significantly narrow wetlands that are protected in Vermont. There's been a really big debate over regulating wetlands on farms. I noted earlier that there is an exemption for farming activities um, on land used to grow food and crops that have been in rotation growing food and crops since 1990. Um, the Agency of Agriculture, based on a bill that passed a couple of years ago, uh, has been arguing that the Agency of Natural Resources doesn't have jurisdiction over any wetland um, activities and wetlands that are on farms. And we don't agree with that. The Agency of Natural Resources doesn't agree with that. So that change hasn't gone into effect, but it's out there. It's something that um, 
we're constantly looking to see if it's if it's going to be implemented by the Scott administration and the Agency of Agriculture that we're concerned about. Um, and in this, you know, the latest iteration of this process, uh, the NRC and we've been working really closely with Conservation Law Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, Vermont Audubon, um, to basically say, if we're going to change the wetland rules, actually, let's strengthen them. Right now in the wetland rules, there's a no net loss of wetlands policy, uh, meaning that we shouldn't lose, you know, any more wetlands as we're protecting them through the regulatory program. We've lost, no one really knows exactly how many, much wetlands we've lost since we've been measuring things like wetland loss, but it's estimated to be 30, 35% of the wetlands from basically the time where, uh, you know, we started to really develop here in North America and in Vermont. Um, so we're, we're proposing to actually have a net gain of wetlands policy, and that would be through having more robust compensation policies. I mentioned that earlier that we don't really implement the compensation policies in Vermont only with really big projects. The projects that I know where there's been compensation has to do with highway projects uh, where there's so much wetland impact that the state of Vermont, and it's often prompted by the Army Corps that actually does have a compensation policy, um, steps in and says, you know, you've got to restore some wetlands. So if we really looked at that, you know, compensation policy um, more closely, had some sort of like banking system even potentially where people could pay into a fund and we could use that money to restore wetlands. That's something that we think it's, it, we, we, we need to see with climate change, wetlands are gonna become more and more important um, for all the reasons that Karina uh, went through. So we're gonna be pushing that and we could use people's help. We'd like to see more wetlands mapping. As I mentioned, proposals over the last few years have been to get rid of the mapping. We think actually there should be more mapping uh, it'll be clear which wetlands are protected. It's good for landowners. It's good for, uh, you know, people who are concerned about protecting wetlands to understand what's there and what, we, what, what we're losing and what we're gaining. We, uh, this is something that the Agency of Natural Resources wants to work on. And we, we, you know, we think that it is an important issue, but really the devil's in the details. As I said, if you need a permit, you have to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to wetlands and we can use some more clarity about what does it mean to avoid minimize and mitigate when has when has uh an applicant sufficiently avoided and minimized in, in particular um having some more uniform uh rules and standards around that um and finally there was a bill in the legislature that is in the legislature this year but it, it, due to COVID, it's not going to really get attention um and uh, but I think it will next year, and we think it's a good bill. It would basically require an alternatives analysis for certain projects that impact um, so much wetlands that you need that water quality certificate I mentioned earlier. So you need an Army Corps permit. So then that, that would mean that you would also need a water quality certificate from A&R, so not the Class II wetland permit. And many states, through that process of water quality certificate permitting for, for large for projects that have large impacts to wetlands to say the applicant, hey, you have to show us that there's not an alternative that would have less of an impact. And this is especially useful with these large pipeline projects, which we've seen a few in Vermont, because it really kind of begs the question, do we really need, like, do we need to put the pipe this way over in this direction? Do we move it here? You know, maybe we really don't need to run the pipe that far. It, it just forces all of those questions to be answered. And through asking those questions, you can often really change the nature of a project and reduce impacts to wetlands. The other part of the bill is uh, just to clarify, there's a little quirk in our laws that we've been talking about the Vermont wetland rules. We also have the Vermont water quality standards and A&R and VNRC and, and, and I, 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 I would assume Karina like in her, in her previous life as a consultant would view wetlands as waters of, of, of Vermont, waters of the U.S. Not, you know, that they're, they're contiguous, they're connected to rivers and streams and they're, they're, they're waters, they're not just wetlands. Um, that's not crystal clear in the water quality standards. So even though it's been interpreted that way, we just feel that we should just um, clear that up. So there's no question about it. And that's it. We're at the question slide.
And I think um, just I'll add one thing that maybe isn't a regulatory change, but something that overall we need to do a better job of in Vermont and nationally is understanding wetlands and educating our next generation about wetlands. And I think that a lot of the problems um, people get in with wetlands is they don't even realize they're in one. So learning number one, what a wetland is, what it looks like, and um, recognizing its importance is an important step in avoiding impacts and protecting them for the future. So I have a picture of my daughter helping and my nephew helping spotted salamanders across the road. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love wetlands too, Karina. I was like, when I was in law school, I wrote, I did a whole independent study on the importance of wetlands and, and uh, I got way into it and I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't even have good muck boots. I was just getting my sneakers all wet. And, but no, they're really, they are. And I did see the quotes all the time that they're the kidneys of uh, the kidneys of the earth. <laughs> well, thank you both for that presentation. Um, I was going to suggest that since we have an intimate group, if ever anyone is has a question, they can just I will unmute you and um, we can have a discussion. You're also welcome to put the question in the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna escape from the presentation. Is that okay? So I can see. Yeah. I can't see the uh, chat. Here, I'll, I'll stop your screen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there we go. All right, well, um, anyone should feel free to chime in with their voice. But I do have a question in the meantime, which is, you know, I've been hearing a lot lately about people rewilding their, um, their fields out behind their homes and, and stopping mowing if, if they feel wet ground or, or doing things to restore natural ecosystems. I'm just wondering, how effective is that in restoring wetlands ecosystems, even in your backyard? And, and what can people do to um, encourage that in their own, on their own property? Whether it's like a large swath of land or just a, a backyard spot and how effective and important is it to do that? Yeah, um, yeah. I, think, I think a huge piece of that is um, stopping mowing or discontinuing mowing or mowing less. So, you know, as soon as you stop mowing, if you have a wet spot in your yard that maybe is difficult to mow anyway, and um, you have, you know, the interest and or just understand the benefits of letting that go and revegetate, you can, that wetland will quickly transition into a forested wetland in Vermont. Like it's amazing how fast um, those communities revegetate. And you can help it along by planting native plants. Um, Vermont Wetland Plant Supply in Southern Vermont and Orwell um, has a bunch of native wetland plants um, and they can help you pick plants based on soil type. So I think it has tremendous benefits and sometimes it's as easy as stopping mowing or fencing that area off if you have pasture and keeping your cows or horses away from it and watching, watching it naturally revegetate. Um, John, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, yes, that's all you, that's great. <laughs> so I have a question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so is, is that our goal then ultimately is to have, so I have a, a wet meadow um, on the property and, and that extends, um, on the, on the neighboring properties as well. So I would say between the three lots, we probably have about 15 acres or so of, of contiguous wetland, but is that the goal to have it go back to um, forested um, wetland or is there some, cause right now, I mean, I have uh, harriers and bitterns and all kinds of birds that use the wetland um, for breeding and hunting. Um, so is there a case to be made for, you know, keeping it open and not letting it revert necessarily back to forest? Uh, Sabina, that's a really good question. And um, I'm gr glad you brought it up. And I think that really depends who you're asking. And, I, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying there's a right and a wrong 
I do think um, if we let most of Vermont, you know, go wild, it would revert back to forest and that's historically what it was. Um, but, you know, some of us <laughs> manage for bird species that have been here post sheep farming era as well. And um, I think those, you know, those emergent wetlands are wonderful for those bird species that you have. So I think, I think you can manage for both. And I think that um, creating mosaics of, of forested wetlands and shrub wetlands and grassland wetlands are important and definitely provide a more diverse mix of wildlife habitat. Um, so I think that's a really good question and I don't know if I have an answer for you, but <laughs> I do think that, that probably historically that wetland would revert back to forest if, if it right. were to be Right, I mean, some of the areas, um, especially on my neighbor's side, you know, already have red maples and things where he hasn't, you know, done done anything. Um, it's a it's a kind of a continuum um, with shrubs like red osier, dogwood, alders, and then going all the way into pines and and maples and the yeah. elms are the elms are all dead, but well, one is still alive. But anyway, um, my other question is um, so. I, uh, on another piece of, of land that I have behind this property that I'm talking about, um, um, I believe it it is it is part of a wetland complex. Um, and so based on what you were saying about the five year rule, um, should I should I have that reevaluated? Because I think that that was um, established before five years ago. So um, would that be prudent for me to kind of have that re-evaluated and, and re-established as, as a wetland? And, and the, the property is in, in UVA, so um, does having it delineated as a wetland affect that um, relationship with the forest management plan? Mm. Um, yeah, those are both good questions. I think that you definitely, so unless you're developing it, you don't in theory need to um, have no, it. I'm not, yeah, no, it's just staying but, open. Yeah. But I think that um, having a new delineation is really good because there's a lot that's happened in the past five years and even 10 years in Vermont with the wetland rules. So in like 2010, the Vermont wetland rules changed so that those wetlands it used to be that only wetlands that were on the w Vermont wetlands map were considered class two. And, and then in 2010, it became wetlands, those that are not just on the map can also be class two if they're found to be significant. So a lot of like older developments or wet delineations that you may have had may be pre that time period and they may have been defined as class three then and not class two. Um, so there's that change, but also just the dynamic nature of wetlands could change the shape um, tremendously. I, I, I also believe that there, you know, certain consultants um, in the past have delineated wetlands differently and not necessarily applied that regional supplement that I was speaking to earlier into their characteristics of defining the wetland. So it would be interesting to see, and it would be a good thing to do just to document that. And then from the use value appraisal program, I, there, um, as far as how, I don't know, D, John may be able to speak more to that, but I do think that defining those wetlands areas applies to how management is on those UVA lands. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, uh, the AMPs, which are the practices that um, apply to any logging operation, um, it, it basically prohibits work in wetland areas. And I think that means uh, protected wetlands in Vermont, as Karina is saying. So I do think, you know, whether or not those wetlands are, I don't know, it depends on what your forester did. Maybe your forester went and, you know, said this wetland complex is all uh, wetland as far as the, the management plan, your forest management plan is, is concerned and those areas should be avoided you know, or, you know, but you should really talk to your, uh, to the person who does your forest management plan and ask that person how they address the wetlands and whether um, 
class two or three mattered to them, or they just did an ecological analysis based on the factors that Karina went through. Does that make sense? It does. I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm a new prop, new property owner. So I'm transitioning to a new forester and we have to, um, ride out the old plan and, and we'll be reevaluating it when it expires. But, um, I will certainly talk with my new forester who didn't create the original plan, um, right. about that going forward. Right now it's, it's considered early successional mm -hmm. and there's also a deed restriction that it has to stay open space. Mm -hmm. Um, I think all those things work in favor of, of, the, of the potential wetland area, but, um, um, I guess going back to my question, I, I, you know, I like the fact that it's early successional and would try to manage it, you know, to kind of keep retain some of those features because I think, especially because I'm interested in creating like wildlife and bird habitat. Um, right. Right. Um, that's, that's. I think your forest would probably there is definitely the policy I think at the state is to maintain and even promote early successional habitat right right and i'm sure the forester will be able to talk yeah. with me more about that but i was just curious about the actual official delineation there's a small section that abuts the the, the wetland so okay cool thank you good questions it also has a vernal pool which i monitor for vce so it has a lot of features that i think would would um sway towards keeping it, you know, not reverting to forest. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, are there any other questions? Hi, uh, Great. I, I had a question. Uh, by the way, my internet connection is unstable, so I, I may blot in and out, but uh, the, I, I live in Dorset, and in Dorset, it's known for its marsh. And also, I know John Goldman's very familiar with the town of Dorset. I believe he did some work for the town some time back in terms of our water resources. Anyway, the unique thing about Dorset is that we are really con contain the headwaters of both Otter Creek, the Meadowy, and uh, let's see, it's Meadowy, uh, Otter Creek, and the uh, Batten Kill. And the uh, and there are is also a very large uh, Dorset Marsh, and one of the things that constantly goes on in Dorset is a lot of people have their lawns tended professionally, and they use a lot of those uh, lawn chemicals. You see the little signs out on the yard, not to, you know, that it's a chemical's just been applied uh, every spring. I don't know if it's done again in the fall. But I'm wondering what publicity wise on a wide scale to let people know that they're impacting water resources when they do that. That's the end of my question. <laughs> could, um, could you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You want to go first, Karina? Um, sure. Thank you, Ellen. I think that's a really important point. I've been noticing those signs in, you know, throughout Vermont and not just for um, fertilizer, but also pesticides, you know, spraying for ticks and insects. And um, it, yes, I think it is a really important message that needs to be spread about the concerns there related to water resources. And I think you raise a really good point. I don't know if I have an answer to your question, but I'll pass it over to John and see if he, he does. That's really, it's a really good point. We, we do a really not a good job in Vermont in, um, in, in dealing with pesticide application. Um, and, I, you know, we're, you know, VNRC, we've been working with a coalition of groups to try to really beef up the pesticide laws in Vermont and to limit uh, certain pesticides, prohibit certain pesticides from being used. And it's been uh, an uphill battle because as an agricultural state, there is a real bias towards uh, the use of pesticides. I know you're talking about for lawn maintenance for residential, but there really isn't a distinction. You know, it's it's either available or, or it's not for, for use. So I I do think that um, more education is needed. I think you know 
you know, Karina mentioned earlier how we need to do better education around wetlands. We've been talking a lot recently that, and, and this is going to be relevant to the budget challenges that the agency of natural resources faces. You know, they've been underfunded for years. They, they haven't had money to do education, right? To, to educate people about what is a wetland? Why are they important? You know, just everything that we went through. And then the uh, impacts of, of, you know, using pesticides on lawns and, and gardens um, and why it should be avoided um, and what are some alternatives, you know? So I, I think that this is an area where we, there are a lot more work needs to be done. So I think you've identified a problem. There's not a great solution out there. Can I ask Ellen a question too? Like Ellen, does, does Dorset have a conservation commission? It looks like Ellen might have dropped off, but um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully she'll be back momentarily. Um, that's a really good point. I think where you're going, like I think on the local level, that's something <laughs> that because there's not good state laws on this, and it's hard to to you know we're going to keep working at it, but it's hard to pass state laws because of all the agriculture pressure to allow pesticides to be used. I, but yes, conservation committee, there's a lot of good work being done in terms of, uh, um, you know, that sort of, you know, public messaging and education and uh, um, thing, things like that. Um, I did, I, I'm sorry that, that Ellen dropped off because the, Dor the Dorset Marsh is a class one wetland. It's one of, it was one of the first, it might've been the first, actually. Mm -hmm. but. Well, uh, when I send around the recording, I'll make sure to, send Ellen a personal note, <laughs> making sure she, she saw the rest of your response. So, um, well, thanks everyone. Thanks to Karina and John for this great presentation. I learned a lot. And thanks to those who attended. Um, look out for the link to the recording. You can share it with whomever, whomever you'd like. And yeah, thanks for joining us on this beautiful day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank thanks. you.